The saga of Hillsong Church does never seem to end. From the recent docuseries about Carl Lentz and Brian Houston to the ongoing court case. But one thing that has a lot of people quiet is now that the verdict has came down, no one seems to be addressing Brian Houston and the fact that he was found innocent. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. In his case against him not properly reporting some things about his dad, the verdict came down and he was found innocent. And so we're going to be looking at a recent conversation he just had on the news and addressing was there a media bias and an ax to grind with him or was he really complicit in some things that he shouldn't have done? And does do the people at large ultimately owe him an apology? So let's jump into this conversation. This is Sky News Australia. Just trigger warning. Some of this content's pretty dark. 24 years ago, his father, Frank, now dead, told his son he abused a boy seven years old at the time, in 1970. Now, Houston did not go to the police. He said the victim, by then in his late 30s, had told him he did not want police told, had not told police himself, and he was an adult. But that victim now says, well, I didn't say that, and police charged Houston with concealing the crime to protect his church. And today, the magistrate, though, hearing the case, said, no, Houston did have a reasonable excuse under the law not to tell authorities. He knew or believed on reasonable grounds that the victim did not want this matter reported to police. Hmm. Brian Houston joined me a short while ago. Brian Houston, thank you so much for your time. How did it get to this, you being charged when the magistrate says you were just doing what the victim wanted? Well, I think that's a big question. And unfortunately, it's been taking 25 years for that to finally today be answered. 25 years. You said outside the court today you were the victim of a targeted attack. What do you mean by that? Well, I genuinely believe that if I wasn't Brian Houston from Hillsong Church, this charge would never have happened. There were many people who were aware of the accusations about my father before I was, and none of them did anything, in fact, about it. I was the one who confronted my father, and I ended up being the one many years later getting charged. Hmm. I think that uh, there is a hostility that comes towards especially prominent pastors, people who are doing something a little different than the norm. You know, a lot of people will want to know, what did you do about your father when he admitted to you uh, in 1999 that he had abused that boy? Uh, Was it like, uh, you know, the accusation was when the prosecutors, you're trying to all keep it quiet. Is that what you actually did? No, in fact, the exact opposite. And one of the things that came out today in the judgment was that the judge believed, the magistrate believed that in a way, exactly the opposite to a cover up, which is what I've always believed because that's exactly what happened. I began to tell people immediately. So interesting. So so guys don't know the timeline. His dad did some stuff to a friend of a family's kid a couple of decades ago. Right now, the, the issue with situations like this is seldom those like one off situations that there's probably other people involved. Nevertheless, Houston found out about it and apparently had his father sat down for ministry. This is in the early 2000s when he comp- uh, talked to the victim. The victim said that he did not want to, him to go police and he did not want this to be a public matter. At this point, he was in his 30s. So what he's being charged with is concealing the man, the matter. The issue is that the victim was already a grown man and could have potentially went to the police himself, but he didn't. And so it, it gets really, really murky in this sort of situation. So you told the church you uh, got your father out of the church. Is that correct? I suspended his credential after I confronted him. And then I uh, went to the board members of both the church he pastored, Sydney Christian Life Centre, and the church that I pastored, which then was Hills, Hills Christian Life Centre, became Hillsong Church. And uh, systematically from there, spoke to leaders, spoke to various groups in the church. As I think I said, I spoke to the National Executive of the Assemblies of God, who were the governing body. It's a movement of around 1,100 churches. And so I always felt like I got on the front foot and addressed the situation. And was, to be honest, a little bit shocked that this even ended up in a Royal Commission in 2014, which now is nine years ago. So 25 years since this happened, over 50 years since his abuses, nine years since the Royal Commission, two years since I got charged. And then finally today in 2023, we got to this point. Now that that sounds like, if we just pause for a moment and, and just humanize the situation regardless on how big the church is regardless on how may they may or may not have mishandled the money that sounds like a roller coaster of emotions to go through for the past number of years to be dealing with all this stuff on top of his elders just board kind of forcing him to step down on top of all the other independent hillsong or interdependent hillsongs who are had their own scandals from the Carl Lentz's to the other churches. That sounds like a whole lot to be to be dealing with. Now, your argument was the victim tells you, I don't want you to go to the police. By the time you know it, he's yes. in his late 30s. He could himself go to the police and apparently hadn't yes. done so and hadn't turned his mind to doing that. 
do you think you were justified in not going to the police yourself? That's a good question. Well, it's the exact words to me were, I don't want you to tell the police. He said, if anyone is going to go to the police, it will be me. But that was also substantiated by his mother, who had told me didn't want to go to the police, and other people who were privy to the information of this, you know, that my dad had allegedly abused Brett Singstock. And so there was a clear narrative. He didn't want the police involved. And he was 37 when I first found out. Hmm. I mean, listen, at 37, you're a grown man. The media loved him. I, I, I will be curious, though, did he... Did he think to go and do any sort of independent investigation or, or get a board to do any sort of independent investigation? Because, again, as an elder, especially as someone in his position that's leading this multinational movement, you're, you're called to be above reproach per First Timothy 3. Now, if you're called to be above reproach, I would assume be above reproach is let's go investigate and see if there are other victims out there. All right, it's official. Took some work, took some maneuvering, but we are now offering a virtual ticket to our live podcast event happening August 26th in Oceanside. So if you can't make it to Oceanside, if you're not from Southern California, go to RuslanLive.com to get your virtual ticket to join us live while we'll be streaming the event to all you guys watching who can't be here with us in person. What if the very things that Christian culture often dismisses as worldly actually aren't bad desires? What do I mean by that? It's obvious that the world values things like money, fitness, fame, and immediate gratification. But I like to propose that those natural human desires can actually be redirected with God's words and God's ways of doing things in order to bring glory to him and serve our neighbor on this side of eternity. And I like to call this very concept God-driven ambition. And we'll be unpacking all of this at my very first live podcast in-person gathering happening August 26th in Oceanside, California. We'll have God Logic Apologetics, Pastor Jeff Moores from Rhythm Church, John Keith, Trizzle Fitness, and hosted by my guy Ray Rock. Lock it in on your calendars right now, Saturday, August 26th in Oceanside, California at Rhythm Church. Click the button down below or go to RuslanLive.com to get more information and get your ticket now. To have made it look like this, you know, I found this out when it was a seven-year-old boy. And if that was the instance, obviously we would have gone to the police. But no, it was a 37-year-old man. And all the way up to when my father died uh, five years later, who I do feel very sad for, uh, but he hadn't still gone to the police at that point. And nor had anyone else. Yeah, that, that, that's, 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 that, that's a good point. If you're 37 at this point and, you know, you, I don't understand how the victim would be mad at him for not going. Yeah, that's, that's a bit complicated. And yeah, I don't know. That's, that's interesting. Are complicit because they built a narrative on a premise on a premise that was completely false, and uh, of that narrative, by omission, I think omission is one of the biggest tools uh, of pictures that are painted. Not mentioning that this wasn't a boy that I found out was being abused. It was a 37-year-old man who had been abused in the 1970s when I was a teenager, by the way, and obviously I was unaware of it. So I think the fact that this even came to the point where the DPP charged me was pressure from the media. You were charged with drunk driving in the U.S. two years ago. You were investigated by your church. For okay, so drunk driving, To uh, honest question. If your pastor got charged with drunk driving and got arrested and charged with it, does he continue ministering? Honest question. Does he At your, at your church, does he continue ministering? I mean, that's a, that's a serious, like you're putting other people's lives at risk. I would say disqualification for at least for a season. Actually being inappropriate with two female staffers around the same time. You resigned as the church's pastor. Uh, you went to the U.S. Uh, what on earth happened there? What is this uh, connected? Are they just different sort of uh, unfortunate events? Uh, what happened? Uh, those are big, big questions. I do think from the time in 1999 when I found out about my father, that basically framed so much of my life from that point till now. Uh, completely changed the day-to-day -day things I was addressing in life. And yes, sadly, over those years, and particularly in more recent years, I didn't handle all those things well. Uh, I know a lot of the narratives out there, false, not right. I never had a sexual issue. I had a substance issue. And uh, Wow, this is the first time I've heard him acknowledge that he had a substance issue. Because remember, I could, I could pull up the clips. Initially, he denied that he had any sort of issue with alcohol. One of those was sleeping tablets, which I overcame in 2012. I've never taken a single sleeping tablet till t since 2012. And then the sad day at a Hillsong conference, which is just a night of shame. I'm very embarrassed about. But again, it's not what people think. It that happened after 2012. But again, it's not what people... Okay, so he stopped taking sleeping tablets in 2012, but he kept abusing alcohol. I think it is. I'll leave that for another time to talk about. And uh, I knocked on the wrong door. In fact, I knocked on the door next to our door. And I thought that person was in our room in the state of confusion that I was in. But you stayed in there 45 minutes? That's a story for another day. Oh, man. 
this, this is hard to watch. Uh, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I love serving him. I love people. I love the congregation at Hillsong. We still miss them desperately. And so I'm full of uh, expectation that we'll forge out something for the future. You didn't want to talk about the uh, two cases in, uh, where the church investigated uh, harassment alleged of, uh, of, of two women, one of whom quit the uh, church. With the one issue was in 2012. I sent a single text. It was reported as some text, but it was a single text. And it said simply, uh, under the influence of sleeping tablets, it said simply, um, if I'd have seen you, I may have wanted to hug and kiss you. Uh, it was a stupid text. I was not conscious in a state of subconsciousness. And when I woke up in the morning and realized what I'd done, it wasn't something. Okay, so he's saying the worst of it was that text he sent in 2012 and that, you know, that, that was the worst of it. Okay. That was done pre premeditated or anything like that. And I apologized immediately. Okay, so here's the frustrating part. Here's the frustrating part. He said that they omitted stuff. And here, it seems like he's omitting stuff. He's talking about 2012 and the sleeping tablets, but we're not talking about the DUI he caught. He just caught the DUI. Brian Houston from church has been charged with driving under the influence of alcohol in the U.S. Brian Houston was charged in Orange County, California in February of last year. This is 2022, February of 2022, after recording a blood alcohol reading of 0 0.08. Okay, so you clearly have to have a uh, more than a sip of alcohol <laughs> to, to, to blow a 0 .08, is a 0 0.08. I'm no expert here according to court records obtained by Daily Telegraph. Houston posted on his personal Instagram account Wednesday and acknowledged the incident calling his decision to drive under the influence foolish. So he owned it. And then in 2019 is the situation where, again, I took a double dose of anti-anxiety tablets. I only ever happened once. I never had a problem with those tablets. They happened once, but mixed with alcohol, again, I was- And let me guess, your dad only touched that seven-year-old once. Is that the is that is that the narrative? All this stuff is there, just uh, the isolated incident instances. You only one 2012 and 2017, and then the DUI only happened once. Like, nice come fact. on, anybody that knows folks in our personal life who deal with addiction and deal with struggle like this knows that no one ends up in these situations because once, once. No, it's never just once. This is a pattern. This is a pattern of behavior, and it compounds. And these folks need help and treatment and confession and transparency and accountability. These aren't just once. Two things can be true at the same time. Brian Houston being uh, prosecuted in this whole situation and uh, unfair media coverage towards Hillsong. And, and we already covered that series and all the weird backdoor stuff that they put into that documentary about Hillsong trying to colonize New York City and all the goofy stuff and how they were anti this and bigoted and this and that, right? Just because they believed in the Bible. Unfair treatment by the media. That That's true. But this also can be true, that this man disqualified himself in other ways. Both of these things could be true. It could be unfair treatment towards Hillsong, towards a massive, massive institution that's reaching millions and millions of people and them having an axe to grind with them, maybe for good reasons, maybe for bad reasons, maybe just because they're Christian, maybe just because of how they spend their finances, maybe because of all kinds of reasons. That could be true. Axe to grind. Therefore, he's Brian Houston. So even though the victim didn't want this reported, they took him to task on it. But it, th this is also true that he he disqualified himself in multiple ways and continued ministering. And, and he needs help and he needs treatment and he needs to repent and he needs to get this dealt with. Both of these things could be true. And I think the issue with, with these sorts of situations is we we, we, we just want to take a, a, a side. Brian Houston is an amazing guy and he they came after him and they persecuted him. How dare they? Or Brian Houston, he's the scum of the earth and he's a, a right? Because his dad is a, like, you, <laughs> both of these things, there's truth in all of it. That, that, that These things are complicated. There's truth in all of it. All right. And so, no, I don't want Christians who are high profile to be persecuted in the way he was and held to very, very uh, maybe un unreasonable standards. At the same time, we also need to keep folks who are leading congregations in check, whether big or small. I don't think any of us would go for this if this was our local church pastor. We would have left churches by now. How is it the people of Hillsong rocked out? Did they just do such a good job of covering this up, right? And then eventually they just pulled the rug out and then it was this big debate. Like so much of this was handled so poorly, but maybe that's the byproduct of running an institution that big. I don't know. Hey, this is a segment from our daily after party stream. Consider partnering with us online for as little as $5 a month to get access to these daily after party streams completely unedited. You'll also get access to our podcast as they are streamed live into the community before anyone else gets to see them, get to interact with our guests, get access to our private Discord server, and a discount code for our store for as little as $5 a month. Ultimately, that will help towards helping us continue contextualizing the gospel using media and podcast here on YouTube. All right, I'll see you over there.
Peace.